Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Charles Green and I'm part of the marketing team here at Belactric Software and I'm going to be your host today. Thank you firstly all for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join this call um, where we're going to be discussing some of the key elements of UX design. Uh, now just very quickly for those of you not familiar with Belactric, we are a leading provider of software software development services from Latin America, with the vast majority of our customers being based in the USA. We work with clients ranging from cutting edge startups to established Fortune 500 companies. And we work with these organizations in turning their ideas into powerful and engaging software products. And a key part of doing that um, is our user experience expertise, the insights and the skills of our designers and our UX experts in creating software that people really want to use. And it's th this that we're going to examine in today's webinar, from the research to the data analysis, branding and visual perception to what are the key trends uh, in UX this year. So we're going to be diving into uh, various aspects uh, of UX design. And to do this, I'm delighted to be joined by a couple of Bellatrix's, Bellatrix's experts today, Alejandra and Bibiana. Uh, Bibiana, do you, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Well, my name is Viviana Benavides, and I work here at Bellatrix in the UX Center of Excellence. I am very passionate for user experience and give both the client and user a great final product. Excellent. Thank you. And Alejandro? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alejandra Rodriguez, and I am part of the marketing team here at Bellatrix. I am responsible for creating industry-leading thought leadership and bringing together the insights of Bellatrix software experts into compelling content. Super, thank you. Um, and before we get started, I should mention that today's session is going to be very open. So we have prepared content, we've prepared some slides uh, for the presentation today, but we're very much looking forward to taking your questions um, at any time. So please feel free to, to write them to us, either in the chat box on the bottom right hand side of your screen, or on Twitter, where we're going to be tweeting using the hashtag UXBellatrix. And we'll be live tweeting throughout, so also you can, you can follow along on Twitter as well. Uh, and we also, we received a couple of questions in the registration form uh, for the call today. Um, so we've set aside some time at the end to answer those questions as well. But without any further ado, let's jump into the session today. Um, and starting with Bibiana, uh, how do you define exactly what UX design is? Okay. UX design is the process of determining what the experience will be when users interact with a service, an interface, or a product. We aim to create enjoyable and frictionless experiences for customers, providing ease of use, accessibility, usability, and pleasure in the interaction. This means users are, are at the center of everything we do, and we believe that UX design is everywhere. Whether you design a device, a building, or even a piece of art, you will always be taking decisions, decisions based on how humans will interact with them. Let's say in the case of the company, this is no different. This is why we most develop user-centered approaches and integrate UX design with other areas of the organization. I think it's, um, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a very interesting perspective, right? How it um, really, our perspective is that UX design is everywhere um, and it's in different parts of an organization. But more specifically, can you tell us about how it relates um, together with the software development lifecycle? Yes, I believe that in order to understand the relationship between design and engineering, it's important to mention that the final product must be functional and useful. So what's the difference between them? Functionality refers to the what, which means the features of the product or interface. It is the ability of a device or an interface to perform according to a specific set of parameters. And on the other hand, usability refers to the how. So how the user is going to interact with that product or interface. It refers to the extent to which a product can be used by specific users to achieve specific goals with effectiveness. Companies must ensure that their product meets functionality and usability, and that is why UX design and software development must work together to create the best possible result. But this integration depends to a great extent on company culture and the understanding the organization has of what a UX designer actually does. 
Sometimes there are misunderstandings between the role of UI and UX, when companies don't invest the time and money that UX design processes actually require. So let's clarify these two concepts. UX designers need to answer questions such as what are the kind of users they are addressing, what are their expectations and priorities, and how can they provide added value to them. In order to answer these questions, they go through a process that involves research, UX strategy, prototyping, and testing. The role of the UI is to use visual elements such as typography, color, and shape to create an experience that is visually enjoyable based on the UX research and objectives. So this means that basically UX design builds the foundation for UI. So having said that, it's important that companies clarify the real scope of UX design to understand that when designers and developers work together, companies are able to create products that meet the needs of users at all levels. And are there any strategies that companies can follow in order to integrate design and computer engineering? Yes, definitely. Uh, firstly, companies need to invest the right amount of time and resources in user research. And this is probably the most important stage of UX design. It is what builds the foundation for the rest of the UX process and provides a user-centric approach to the initial stages of the software development life cycle, like product conceptualization and feature estimation. Uh, it is also important that designers work under the same parameters as developers. This means that if companies are using agile development, it is advisable that designers follow this iterative method as well. For example, designers can work one sprint ahead of developers. This, this will allow them to evaluate and discuss design and software features at the same time with product owners and stakeholders. And if modifications need to be done, designers can provide guidance into how to solve those issues from a UX design perspective. And this significantly reduces costs because issues are solved at early stages. Also, designers can use their skills to effectively communicate with other areas of the company. For example, tools like prototypes and wireframes are very useful to inform other areas about the current state of the project in terms of user interaction, and this fosters day-to-day -day collaboration and the awareness of each other's work. And this is very much what you described there. This is very much the approach that Bellatrix takes when working with um, with our customers when we when we have these projects that are you know integrating uh, you know, sophisticated software uh, development expertise, but also making sure you have making sure you have those kind of design and the user experience alongside that. And a key part of when we're working with our customers involves um, uh, working together with our user experience center of excellence, which uh, Bibiana is a, part, is a part of. So Bibiana, can you tell us how Electrix's UX center of excellence works? Sure. Well, the objective of our UX center of excellence is to provide end-to-end -end services to our clients. We first evaluate the expectations and priorities of, of our customers how they picture their final product, and we discuss how we can create the best possible experience for their users. Our objective is to provide assistance to detect issues at early stages and fix them before they go to development processes, which lowers the cost significantly. We use Agile as a standard methodology, which means our designers work in iterations to constantly test and validate features. One of the strategies to make sure we meet the needs of customers at all levels is to provide an omni channel experience. It consists of creating a seamless journey for customers through integrated channels. This means that users can buy products regardless of location and time. For example, they can start their experience on a physical place, continue on a web page, and finish in a mobile application. And can you tell us uh, what is the difference between omnichannel and multi-channel experiences? Okay, well, by definition, multi means many, while omni means all. This means that multi-channel offers as many channels as possible to provide a positive experience. However, those channels are not integrated between one another. Omnichannel, on the other hand, seeks to harmonize and integrate all channels to offer consistency and an overall satisfactory experience. In other words, with multi-channel experience, the user might find obstacles to move from one channel to another let's say, from an application to a physical store, for example. While with Omnichannel, users will be able to complete their purchase through different channels without obstacles. Also, 
there are a variety of elements that compose the omnichannel experience. The first one is consistency across channels. This means there is a cohesive message in every touch point. Customers want to address a single identity, which means they expect to find the same information and quality of experience across channels. You can achieve this by creating patterns, choosing a palette of color, standardizing typography, and defining the tone to address your users. Familiar features across channels develop a closer relationship between customers and your brand. Another element of the omnichannel experience is convenience and availability, which means there is a variety of touch points able to respond to the user's need at a given time, and those channels are able to integrate online and offline experiences. Finally, neutrality. It's about offering the same quality across channels. It avoids concentrating too much on a single channel, risking a poor experience in the rest of the touch points. But it is not about offering the exact same content in all of the touch points. It's about knowing the specificities and strengths of every channel while offering a meaningful, sorry, meaningful experiences in all of them. Like that, we can get the best out of every channel to achieve the same objective. Absolutely, and then when you when you spoke about the idea and the, the purpose behind this is really about creating these meaningful experiences. So, can you tell us about what are some of the methods that you use to create such experiences? Um, I understand a variety of techniques, um, and what what is the criteria that you use to choose a particular set of techniques? Well, I like to start by saying that it's crucial to know the objectives of your project and what are the questions you need to solve in order to choose the best UX techniques. It is very helpful to ask yourself questions such as, what do I want to know and why? Then, the UX methods come to play to find out the how. Also, the set of methods you choose depend on many factors. You can use certain UX techniques based on the stage of product development you're in. For example, and in the first stage, which is product research, the objective is to explore and answer what people are already using. What is the business climate and what are our assumptions about the user's expectations and behavior. To answer this, you can conduct contextual and individual interviews or surveys. For the next stage, which is the creation of the USX strategy, the objective is to build and validate the information architecture and define categories of the product or the interface. Here you can create personas, which are semi-fictional representations of users. They are really helpful to have a clear picture of how users will interact with your product and services. And in the final stage, you create prototypes in order to measure how easy it is for users to complete a task. Here, um, wireframes, user flow diagram, um, sorry, user flow diagrams and sitemaps are helpful to create high fidelity prototypes and test the usability. Also, uh, you can take into account the behavioral versus the attitudinal axis. The behavioral axis aims to answer what people do. A-B testing and eye tracking are useful methods to explore the behavioral axis. On the other hand, the attitudinal aims to answer what people say. Surveys, interviews, focus groups, and car sorting are useful methods of attitudinal research. And uh, finally, the quantitative axis is helpful if you want to solve questions related to the how many and how much. For example, how many people react to a call to action. On the other hand, the qualitative data will help you answer questions related to why and how. For example, why there is a low or high number of people who react to a call to action. And so we see then that UX design is basically about uh, understanding and, and anticipating users' behavior and their responses. So what is the role then of visual perception, psychology, and, and cultural background in designing these meaningful user experiences? Well, an important part of designing these meaningful experiences is understanding how we physically and psychologically react to the environment. So our bodies were designed to perceive, process, and interpret information to understand the world. There are certain universal responses when we are exposed to visual stimuli. In the field of psychology, the branch that studies the laws of visual perception is called the self, which explores how our mind looks for order amidst disorder or how the whole is greater than its parts. 
the Gestalt principles help designers determine what are the best graphic solutions according to human perception. For example, the principle of continuation relates with how our glance follows, follows a line or path until it finds a particular element. And this is useful for designers because they can guide a user's attention towards certain sections or call to actions in an interface. But the Gestalt principle are neither so the responses of people when they are exposed to external stimuli also depend on culture, beliefs, and mental models. So, how can designers can build a cross-cultural experience? We can examine how culture affects UX design based upon the culture dimensions theory created by the sociologist Gary Hostet. This study describes the effects of a society's culture on the values of its members and how these values relate to behavior. So there are six dimensions, and they are power of distance index, which expresses to what extent societies tolerate inequality, individualism versus collectivism that questions if a society relates with I or we, masculinity versus femininity that refers to how values define societies, masculine societies relate with achievement, heroism, and material rewards for success, while feminine societies relate with cooperation, modesty, caring for the weak, and quality of life. There's also uncertainty avoidance index, which determines to what extent societies are tolerant to ambiguity. Indulgence versus restraint measures if societies allow relatively free gratification of desires, such as enjoying life and having fun. And finally, societies with short-term orientations honor and keep traditions, while societies with long-term orientations view adaptation as a necessity. So, according to these dimensions, designers can better address their target. For example, when designing for societies with low power of distance index, it's important to note that these kind of users are more exigent and they won't easily find their content as valid. That is why interfaces must provide enough and detailed information so users can make their own decisions and have control over their experience. On the other hand, societies with high power of distance index usually don't question authority and will be, will be more likely to easily find their content as valid. So they are less critical and will be looking for detailed information. That is why clear and brief statements in which we don't give the user a lot of responsibility work for this kind of audience. Another example is when users address individualistic versus collectivistic targets. When designing for in interfaces for individualistic societies, designers can provide options and information based on the individual needs of users. So you can use sections like find your favorite option or headlines like exactly what you were looking for. On the contrary, interface design for collectivistic groups need to add social features that enable visitors to connect with others and take their decisions based on the opinion of the community. It is advisable to add social media buttons or reviews and highlight the role of the community for the brand or product. Finally, when designing for societies with high uncertainty avoidance, for example, it is recommendable to use familial patterns and build classic classic structures and navigations. This kind of societies tend to be uh, more uh, conservative. That is why it's important to provide clear information in a simple way, letting the users know what will happen if they take certain actions on the website. But on the other hand, people with low uncertainty avoidance would prefer a cutting edge interface and include different color schemes for different sections. And you can even play with copyright to come up with something different than a home button, for example. Okay, so you, you've explained that, Ali, some of the, um, you know, some of the key principles that help designers make decisions when they're creating these experiences. Um, but also UX design is evolving according to, to the current business and technology landscape. So we see, for example, that design is having to accommodate uh, screenless interfaces, and we're seeing new jobs in UX design emerging. So can you talk to us a bit more in detail about what are some of the UX trends this year? Yes, of course. One of the most important trends for this year is the emergence of voice-based systems. Uh, virtual assistants such as Cortana or Alexa are gaining popularity and traditional graphic interfaces are being disrupted by voice user interfaces. As a result, uh, many interfaces have eliminated the need to type thanks to digital assistants that answer questions and execute a lot of tasks. 
so what does this what does this mean for you as designers firstly designers and developers uh, should be aware of the importance of copywriting for voice interfaces and this brings to the table the crucial role of machine learning to create digital systems that can understand the flow of human conversations to address users in an appropriate way. Also, given the importance of copywriting, the job title of US, UX copy is becoming popular. UX designers can no longer build experiences without taking into consideration the power of narrative. It makes it possible not only to choose the right words for graphic and voice interfaces, but also to build a coherent message through all the channels, which is one of the most important elements of omnichannel, omnichannel experience. Uh, the role of UX writers, then, is to catch the attention of the user and transform complex ideas in enjoyable and digestible content. And when information is simple but interesting, it will be more powerful when evoking emotional responses in users. Excellent, thank you. And I think with that, we've now gone through um, most of the most important elements of UX design. Um, but I want to mention here to the audience today that you know, we've, um, we're have we not just describing this, we're not just working with our customers on these aspects of UX design, but also very much using that in the work here at Bellatrix. And we've been doing that um, with the redesign of our website. We've been working on this uh, over the past uh, few months. and what you're going to be seeing now is a kind of sneak preview of our new website it hasn't been launched yet but it will be going live soon um, but we want to talk to you a little bit about the process uh, behind how we uh, have developed and have nearly finished developing uh, this website so uh, Bibiana can you tell us a bit, a bit about the redesign process sure 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 my favorite project <laughs> so um, in order to execute the UX process our team along with marketing and sales experts went through a series of steps. Firstly, they evaluated the performance of our previous website. Some of the most important conclusions of this stage were the need to improve the bounce rate, make the principal actions more visible, and include different options so users can easily navigate to pages, especially in our blog section, which is the, often the main point of access to our website. Then we carry out a research phase that include benchmarking and interviews. In the benchmarking, the actress is UX designer, analyze a variety of websites according to their navigation, structure, and visual design. Our team also interviews 17 people of different areas of the company according to general questions like, what is the product going to be? Who is the product for? What should this project accomplish for the business? And after the research phase was completed, our team put in practice the UX strategy. This means they created the information architecture, visual design, interactive prototype, and content sheet in which designers work along with the thought leadership area to create new content. Finally, our UX designer created an internal launch strategy in order to inform the lecturers' members about the new changes of the website so they can guide users through it and are able to harness all the new possibilities. Now soon we will be launching the new web page for the public and we are very very excited about it. We will also be publishing a new case study that explore in detail the redesign process. So all of you guys make sure to check out our new website and content. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, we're very much, we're very excited about the new website, uh, which, as mentioned, uh, will be going live uh, very shortly. Um, but with that, I think we've um, come to uh, you know we've covered most of the areas of UX design um, that we wanted to cover today. So I want to take this um, take this time to um, mention again that if you want to ask us a question, please do so either via the chat box on the right hand side of your screen or via Twitter with the hashtag UX Bellatrix. And we've got a bit more time uh, in a couple of minutes time to take those questions. Um, but just to, to close the session off, um, Ali, do you have any um, kind of concluding remarks you'd like to leave the audience with? Yes, sure. Well, I think UX design practices involve a variety of aspects that range from analyzing quantitative data to understanding how uh, psychology and culture shape our interactions with interfaces and products. 
and user-centric approaches are becoming a must for companies and the technology industry is increasingly aware of the value of the holistic view of UX design and our channel experiences. So the bottom line is that UX design is a very complex and fascinating domain that evolves according to the advancements of technology and the needs of demanding customers. And that is why organizations must invest time and resources in this powerful tool, as well as they need to see abreast of the latest trends to adjust their practices to create wonderful user experiences. Nice, and thank you. I think, I mean, absolutely just to, to reiterate that point that um, everything we're doing here with UX design is about creating these powerful user experiences. Um, you know, when, you, when we look at you know, many of the products which are being created today. Uh, you, you see from uh, companies, whether it's at Apple or it's Disney, you see these companies building very powerful uh, experiences, which other companies also now need to need to match with their own products and services. Um, so now let's move on to the, the Q&A session. Um, actually join the registration process for this webinar. We did receive a couple of questions and I want to start off by taking those. Um, the first question is about what is the role of prototyping in engaging users? Okay, well, when you create a prototype, the objective is to test the functionality and usability of the interface. If your prototype reflects the most important aspects of your product in a positive way, you will be able to detect problems and fix them. This way, the prototype ensures that the final result meets the needs of your users. Also, since you can test the prototype with real users, they can get interested in knowing how the final product will look like. But this will happen if the prototype offers a good experience. Otherwise, um, this might just push them away. And also, this is why the previous phases are so, so important, because they give you the foundation to create a high-quality prototype even if it's low fidelity prototype. When you reach this point, you're supposed to know what the users need, need and want. So with this prototype, you're making sure you're going the right way to move forward in the process. Excellent, thank you, Viviana. Yeah. And actually, we've just got a, a question uh, which has just come in based on, based on your response. Um, and that is, is it critical for the prototype to be high fidelity? No, I think it's more critical for a prototype to have a high quality than a high fidelity. Sometimes you work with a low fidelity prototype and you get really, really good results to keep moving forward. In this case, the high fidelity prototype just proves that the functionality and usability is as good as in the low fidelity prototype. Once um, prototypes are successful, you can start building the visual structure of the interface. This is why it's always good to test both prototypes. Okay, excellent, thank you. Yeah. And actually, whilst you were speaking, we've got a, another question which has come in from the audience. Uh, and that is, to what kind of projects does UX apply? Okay, in my personal experience, UX applies for absolutely every kind of project, as we mentioned before. UX can be found in art projects, building, a machine, everything should have UX. Let's say I took this path, the digital path, and it applies for web, app, and any kind of software. Of course, in some projects, we need a deeper study of the UX design than others. For example, if I'm an industrial designer and I want to create a table with three table legs, I might need to test a 3D prototype or a real prototype. So I know, so I know the table actually works normally. And this is just an example. Or if I'm working with an app design, I might need my digital prototypes, low and high fidelity, just to test every aspect of the project. Excellent, thank you. Um, let's just see if um, any further questions come in at the moment. I'll just give it, a look, give it a moment. Uh, at the moment, we don't have any additional questions, but we are we are um, we have plenty of time. So if you do have uh, an additional question, please do write to us uh, now. And if a question does come to you, you know, uh, afterwards uh, after you finish the call, then again, please do feel free to, to reach out to us, and we'll be happy to take the to take the question offline. But at the moment, I don't see that we have any additional questions. 
Um, so I think this is, we're now nearly at half past the hour, so I think it's a good time to, to wrap up the call. Um, I'd like to say firstly a very big thank you to, um, to Alejandro and to Bibiana for, for sharing your expertise today. It's been, uh, it's been very insightful uh, to, get your, uh, to get your expertise uh, on user experience. Also thank you to everyone who joined the course today and for taking the time to join us. As mentioned, if uh, you want to discuss this further, uh, please do feel free to reach out to us. As I hope you can tell we're, we're very passionate uh, about user experience, very passionate about software development. Um, so we'd be delighted to continue the conversation with you. Uh, Alejandro, Bibiano, do you have any final comments you'd like to leave the audience with? Just thank you everyone for join, joining this webinar today. I hope it, it was uh, helpful and I, we hope we, we provided uh, useful information and meaningful information for all of you. Yeah, well, I'm agreeing with uh, Alejandra. Thank you, everyone. And yeah, I think it's really, really important to keep the, in mind that UX uh, it's really important and it's really necessary. So if anyone has a question or a doubt in the future, just come out and contact us. Excellent, thank you. Um, and I should mention to the audience, to everyone on the line that a recording will be available uh, within the next 24 hours, so please do check back to our website uh, and then you'll find the recording of this session. With that, thank you once again for joining the call and I wish everyone a very pleasant rest of the day.